President Biden says if Congress won't act, he'll do something to address the heat. So let me be clear. Climate change is an emergency. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to use the power I have as president to turn these words into formal, official government actions through the appropriate proclamations, executive orders, and regulatory power that a president possesses. That was President Biden earlier this afternoon in Somerset, Massachusetts, trying to kindle support for the left's green agenda. We're going to talk about that today. We're also going to talk about the fact that only 1 percent of voters in a recent New York Times poll said climate change was the most important issue. To most Americans, the clear and present dangers are record-setting inflation rates and record energy prices. The reality is the president's continued pursuit of a Green Deal would actually cost Americans even more money. Right now, Washington Democrats are frustrated by the pace of the radical green transformation they envision for our country. They're having trouble getting enough senators to agree to make the most reliable and abundant forms of American energy more expensive for working Americans. That was Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell today. Indiana Senator Mike Braun joins us for a discussion on the green, not only on climate issues, but on his measure to actually balance the nation's budget. The Senate will be voting on that this evening. We'll also talk with Myron Ebel, director of the Competitive Enterprise Institute Center for Energy and Environment, about what President Biden might be able to pursue through executive action. Also, Andy McCarthy joins us to talk about the dangers of the, emergency de the use of emergency declarations and the increasing use of executive power, all designed to circumvent the lack of legislative consensus. And you remember this historic summit earlier this month on the threat from communist China? The most game-changing challenge we face comes from the Chinese Communist Party. It's covertly applying pressure across the globe. This might feel abstract, but it's real and it's pressing. We need to talk about it. We need to act. That was MI5 Director General Ken McCallum on July 6th in the first ever joint address between MI5 and the FBI. There certainly has been a lot of talking among politicians in the U.S. about the threat from communist China, but Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota says it's time to act, and he joins us a little bit later here on Washington Watch. And on the heels of Speaker Pelosi's House vote to codify the redefinition of marriage by the court back in 2015, Democrat leader Chuck Schumer says the Senate is next. I want to bring this bill to the floor, and we're working to get the necessary Senate Republican support to ensure it would pass. Well, will there be the support in the Senate? We're going to talk about that. We'll talk with Wisconsin Congressman Glenn Grothman about it, as well as the State Department giving grants to promote atheism. That's right, the State Department using your tax dollars to promote atheism. We're going to talk about that. The website, TonyPerkins.com, lots of information there for you, so be sure and visit TonyPerkins.com. And it's time to register for this year's Pray, Vote, Stand Summit, which will be held at the First Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, September the 14th through the 16th. A great lineup of speakers, as usual. To find out more, go to prayvotestand.org slash summit. Today's word, coming from the Stand on the Word Bible reading plan, is found in Psalm 55, it's verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. What a promise. You know, David, betrayed by someone close to him, which put his very life in danger, knew where to turn to the Lord. To join us in this journey through the Bible, you can find out more by going to frc.org slash Bible. Despite the 9.1% one, the inflation rate that is giving every American a steep de facto pay cut, President Biden is currently working on climate and energy policies that will only make our economy worse. The country hasn't had a balanced budget in more than 20 years. And in President Biden's first year in office, the government spent $2.8 trillion, that's with a T, more than they collected, contributing to our current national debt of more than $30 trillion dollars. Joining me now to discuss a plan that he's drafted to get the government back to a balanced budget without raising taxes is Senator Mike Braun of Indiana. He serves on five Senate committees, including the Senate Committee on Budget 
and Senate Committee on Appropriations. Senator, welcome back to the program. Good to be back on, Tony. So you have a plan that would balance the budget, meaning we would not be spending more than what we're taking in without raising any taxes. How do you plan on doing that? That is true. It keeps the Trump uh, tax cuts in place uh, from December of 2017. That's driven Main Street uh, through small businesses and been really behind that strong economy. And here, I want to make it so easy, Tony, that nobody at least a Republican can say no to it because 10 years, it takes what we used to categorize as discretionary spending. In other words, where you had to budget, where you had to appropriate, we're gonna put it back there from mandatory. The gimmick here has been to put everything on autopilot, just like our entitlements, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and a host of others. And you know why? That takes it out of the budgeting and appropriating the roll up your sleeves that you need to do to make sure you're spending money correctly. It's now manifested itself into trillion and a half dollar deficits annually. Joe Biden, his blueprint for the country is in 10 years to be 45 trillion dollars in debt. In other words, 1.5 trillion average over the next 10 years what a business plan for future generations, our kids and grandkids. It's shameful. Now, Senator, uh, to be clear, your proposal would not cut defense spending. You're going to continue to defend the nation. Wouldn't cut Medicare, no. Medicaid, or Social Security. So you protect those things that, um, you know, have been essential in the past. And so it's just all these things that you say that have been put on autopilot, really that's kind of in many ways, if I can say it, it's political because you don't have to, you can shield yourself from the political realities of having to make hard decisions. This puts it back into the, to the Congress that has the purse strings to make prudent decisions that will keep our nation strong economically, but also strong from a, from a national defense standpoint. It does it with an amount of 375 billion, which is just basically half of what has been moved to mandatory spending. So it's not gonna be real draconian. And it gives you 10 years to figure out how to whittle that down to zero. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take on reforming Social Security and Medicare. Those are the two biggest drivers of our structural right. deficits. But I didn't want it to be confusing. I want those numbers to still be out there. And yes, we need to take them on because the Medicare trust fund goes completely broke in four years. And we've been paying into it, employers and employees, since the 60s. Social Security, actuarially, we've known it for decades, goes broke in about 10 years. We still need to address them if we're going to get to a place where we start paying off debt. This brings us in 10 years to where we are running a surplus other than the interest payment. And sadly, with all the debt already in the system, that'll be close to a trillion dollars, which will equal defense spending and discretionary spending each. So we got a lot of uh, work to do beyond this. This is just to put a platform out to where we started and to where it'd be hard to see why a Republican would say no. Senator Braun, the, the reality is if we don't do something, as you just pointed out, on the interest alone that we owe on the debt, if we continue to see under this administration the policies that are driving inflation, raising interest rates to try to get that inflation under control, we're not going to be able to service our debt as a nation. No, and as a snapshot right now, you can make the argument, well, it's not that bad. But if you look at where we are now versus just 20 years ago, we are the second most indebted country in the world of a fairly large economy. Only Japan exceeds us. They are the third largest economy in the world and have had trouble growing it because they built debt into their system so aggressively. And a 1% interest change on every trillion dollars is 100 billion. 30 trillion, every 1% interest change is 300 billion. And interest rates, the Fed said they're gonna take up maybe one, two, three points to whip inflation. Look what that will do. Uh, it is really starting to get scary how all this adds up. Everybody here shrugs it off as no big deal. Well, I want to ask you about that, Senator, because you're, you, you've 
own businesses, started out as a small businessman, have an actually pretty successful large business uh, before entering into the, uh, the, the Congress, into the Senate. Is there an understanding of the significance that this poses to America and to our future? I mean, ju not just from a standpoint of being a ball and chain on our economy, but from a standpoint of national security. And that uh, was a little prophetic by uh, Admiral Mike Mullen, who distilled it very simply. I fear the red ink more than I do the red menace. And he would have been a national security expert and you know, was part of the top brass in the military. So yes, even from places like the military, they're worried about what it does to keep this country secure. And yes, as you become feeble financially over time, you can't do the number one thing we ought to be doing, defending the country. Uh, you can't invest in infrastructure and you certainly can't make your entitlements that I think most people would like to see in healthy shape they need to be reformed. Why don't we try to do those three things without borrowing from our kids and grandkids before you start taking on all these other things currently under right. consideration? Now, Senator, there's, uh, in, in the absence of the Senate advancing appropriations bills the way they should, you have an opportunity to present this. Is there going to be a vote on this tonight? There will be. And uh, I think uh, Rand Paul has been the other uh, spokesman on uh, this for years. He did one recently that did get 35 Republican votes, more austere in the sense he wanted to do it over six years. That shouldn't be that difficult. That would take just a little bit of sacrifice. This even makes it easier. And then that's where you're going to get only 35 Republicans voted for that when he did it. All Democrats voted against it, along with 15 Republicans. I'm anxious to see if we get a few more Republicans on board. And if not, we really need to be saying, why aren't you, if you're the party of fiscal responsibility and you're not voting for something as easy as this? Absolutely. And uh, we're going to be tracking that vote very closely. And in fact, after that vote and you're able to dissect it, I'd love to talk with you more about that to see how you move forward with the plan. I think someone has to take this up at some point. We have to address our nation's running deficits and the debt that we have. You're right, Tony, and if you don't, uh, it won't be unlike what happens if you don't do this in other arenas. Even though you've got the printing press in the basement here and you are the sovereign right. currency and you are the federal government, you go through some form of a chapter 11 and uh, that same process would happen. Uh, and sadly, the elderly who depend on social security and Medicare, and those that can't afford health care through Medicaid would suffer the most. Yeah. Senator, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. And as I said, we'll be uh, tracking this uh, very closely. I look forward to talking to you uh, later. My pleasure.